The following interview was conducted with Lila Height for the Purdue University Libraries. It took place on May 5th at her home. Uh, the interviewer, interviewer is Renee Gorder and also present is Stephanie Schmitz. So thank you for agreeing to, to talk with us today. So the first question, when did you first come to Purdue and what brought you here? I first came to Purdue in August of 1973 and we had two daughters in college, one at IU and one at Ball State and um, the other two were working and so it was time I had been a stay-at-home mom and uh, but very active in the community and so forth. They'd done a lot of volunteer kinds of things and so uh, my husband and I tossed it around that I would work away from home or work outside the home. And so I drove to Purdue and went to Free Haver. And back then, you were given a written test, a typing test, and then they interviewed me all in the same day. And then sent me to Terry Courts because the uh, evening desk clerk was available there and I interviewed with uh, Bill Johnson and so he told me about the job and uh, gave me a tour of Terry Court and as we ended he said there was someone else that was interested in the job so you know, I went home and I didn't think a whole lot about it I was wanting to go to work but it wasn't pressing Okay. And so, um, about a week later, I got a call, and it was from Elaine Wilson, and she was manager of Earhart Hall. And I had known Elaine um, when she was a Purdue student. And so, uh, she said, I would really like to interview you. And so, we set the date, and I came in, and it was like within a couple of days. and. So she interviewed me and, and gave me a tour of Earhart. And I started like the next week and came in uh, days and trained with the day secretary. And so I trained for a week during the day and then started the night shift. And um, it was really kind of interesting because the counselors had worked the summer uh, night shift and so anything I needed to know um, they were they were mentoring me during that time so it was really uh, uh, that was how it all happened <laughs> so you were the evening hostess what duties did that position entail? Mostly it was student service. So that meant you waited on the counter. Uh, anything that a student walked up and, and needed, whether it was change or keys, because at that time we had kitchenettes and we had um, two of those original big old computers that had key cards mm -hmm. and they had keys for those. and. Um, Anything copies, anything, well, no, I'm sorry, no copies because we didn't have a copy machine at that <laughs> point. Um, but anything that they needed change, um, anything that really was student service, and of course the phone. But I did not do actual secretarial work. My, my job um, was really student service. Nice. So, in your opinion, since you were at the residence halls for 25 years, how have the halls and the students changed over time? I really didn't think that students themselves changed as far as student needs. Um, the kinds of support that students look for didn't really change that much. They were away from home, they were in an environment 
that could be stressful at times. And I think that the maternity level, as they come in and they're there for four years and go out, you can see such a growth and, and that was really, really neat. As far as the um, job change, there was a number of changes in the 80s and then a number of changes in the 90s. And when I said about the copy machine, we got that probably 82, 83, and before that, everything was done on the mimeograph. Mm -hmm. And we had a, a, a clerk who loved to ink and do all of that, but nobody <laughs> else wanted to have to mess with that because it was a mess. And, and so then in the early 80s, we got our first copy machine. And it was in the back room, and they quickly realized that if I was going to run copies, it had to be out where I could still keep an eye um, on the author. And so that was one of one of the changes. The others, um, smoking was allowed in the East Rec Lounge, and um, that didn't change until the 90s, the wow. early 90s. And so um, they couldn't smoke in their rooms, but they could, could smoke in that East Rec Lounge. And sometimes it got pretty, pretty stiff in there, but that's okay. <laughs> um, I think the other changes were, um, mm, I gotta think. Let me take a quick look here. Oh, I know. Um, was in the early 80s, the n numbers that came onto campus really grew very quickly. And so we had two units. We, we had four in Earhart, but we had two units in very student housing with a staff resident and her husband. And they were there, I think, two years. And then uh, they were E and F units. And then E unit moved to Fowler Court and was there, I think, two years. Then the next step was suites. And it was four rooms at the end of the hall, in the hallway. And there was a door put at, so that you had 10 girls in four rooms on both ends of the hallway. And we had uh, students in our guest apartment. I think there were four, there could have been six, but I think it was four that we had. And they had to be students that were chosen because they had to be very reliable to be back there. So that in itself was a big change. And when we were talking about students, some loved it and some couldn't wait to move out. And when they moved out, so many times they went to apartments. But the ones who also loved it, if they went to an apartment, they went as a group, which said a lot about the friendships and, and so forth that, that they, you know, had. Then in the early 90s, um, smoking was more no more loud and um, everything had to be outside. Uh, I think our, the most changes were under Mrs. Harrington in the 80s and then again under Carolyn Newland uh, in the 90s. But again, you know, as student needs change, ours, ours changed. And the, the computer room uh, was available, and we had quite a few computers, but an hour and a half, they had to sign up. And this was another part of what I did, was do all of the sign-up sheets for everything, you know, that went on. And uh, early on, we had mail exchange, and it was limited to 30. So the guys couldn't sign up, I think it was before 4 or 4.30, but if they didn't get there, and didn't get signed up, they couldn't eat in the hall, 
it had to, they had to be given a ticket to do that. So that was another part of what we did. And so, what did the students use the computers for? They did their, their homework and, and took our photos and they came back. We had two engineering floors. Uh -huh. And so, but yeah, they really, really used the computers mm -hmm. back in the hall. Wow. Mm -hmm. I remember coming across something in I think the exponent, how Earhart had, I want to say coin operated, just word processing computers, right? When computers right. started right. to be a big thing. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I imagine it was a lot of word processing, too. Uh -huh. huh. No Facebooking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. Um, so the, the students at Earhart called you Mom Height. Yes. How do you feel your role at Purdue impacted students? You know, I think students a lot of times just needed somebody to listen and needed to be encouraged at times. Uh, I had a student say, you know, if you really want to know and, and ask advice, you're going to get it because if they ask, I, I get it. But the mom always came out and me. I raised four of my own and so it was probably a very natural progression of, of taking everybody else's line. But, but, you know, I think it was they needed a smile. Sometimes that's all they needed as they walked by. Um, so sometimes they hung out at the counter because they really wanted to talk more. And I did have a rule that if they wanted to talk, they had to understand that they would be interrupted because students always came first. And faculty fellows were the same way, that many times they stayed and talked. And they also knew that I stopped the conversation and waited on students because when a student come, would come to the office, they wanted something. It wasn't that, you know, do you want something? Absolutely, if they want something. That's not a question. It, they help you in, you know, what? What did they need? They have done. But I, I really think a lot of times they needed a sympathetic ear. They needed to share things sometimes that they didn't want to share with another student. Um, if it was something more serious, I learned in the counselor because I felt like that was, I was not their counselor. Um, but we did have students who lost parents, and it's really interesting to me as I thought about it, that back then, it was so many of the fathers, hmm. and it was hard to take. I mean, they would go quickly. Hmm. Now, we see a lot with mothers with cancer. Oh. And, and eventually, in, as we got into the 90s, we saw more of that. But early on, it was really fathers. And, you know, we would attend funerals, we, you know, you, you did those kinds of things as a support system. And you listen. Um, I think more than anything, it was, you just needed to listen. And to care. Mm -hmm. I, I just, I, I love people, so it was not a hard job mm -hmm. to, to, uh, to, to be able to do that. Uh, so Earhart Hall was all female until 2003. Yes, it was. So how did working in an all-women's residence hall impact your work? Do you think that it would have been different if you worked in a co-ed hall? No, because we had a lot of men around. You cannot have that many women and not have a lot of men around. <laughs> and, and they did. I mean, um, it was five young men from Tarkington, my very, very first year, that came and they started that whole mom thing. Oh. I did not have um, a nameplate, so they made me one. And they put Lila Mom High on it. And they came every so often and, and um, I have a 
a, a poster I'll show you that they drew for me. But this was um, a place where men could be comfortable because they had to be escorted. And um, they could be in the formal lounge and they could be in our rec lounges, but they could not get beyond the doors without being escorted. And they had to call up um, um, to, to even do that. I, I think I kind of liked the fact that it was all women. Um, after hours, they come down in their PJs and so forth, and, and they kind of liked that. But when you have that many women, you have, you have men. And they were always respectful. And um, it was, you know, it was one of those things where in my own home, we had boyfriends, but they went home. And, and so it was kind of the same idea that um, they always had, had, had the guys around. And, and, you know, we had men as our faculty fellows. We had men who were in um, the uh, residence hall administration who came. And so um, one I remember very well was Mr. Vernon who came and he would stand right in the middle of the counter, stand there behind the counter, right in the middle. And as I waited on Sue, I'd have to walk behind him. But it was the best view of the whole area. And so he would stand, not say a word, just stand there. And, and I think he enjoyed it. I really do. I think he really enjoyed watching what was going on. So it wasn't just our young men. Um, we had, as I said, men faculty fellows and so forth that came and really participated and was a part of what we did. Are there any student traditions or customs that you remember or anything that made an impression on, upon you? Student traditions. You mean like Popcorn night, Grand Prix. Yeah, or <laughs> movie nights, or just different things. Yes, they did have movie nights. But they also um, really um, promoted special weekends. And they would always have a mom's weekend in the spring. And during that time, they would have a using group. And early on, that was with one of the men's halls. And then toward the end, the women was just in a group themselves. They um, participated in the uh, homecoming displays, sheet signs, and all of that. Um, we always had a queen candidate with the big posters that were put out all over campus um, for the homecoming queen. Um, I'm trying to think. They, they did a dance weekend and a little sims weekend. Um, Earhart only kept little sisters. And, and that sometimes was a little hard sometimes for students, but they only kept the little sisters. Uh, what do you mean by that? They kept little sisters? Overnight. Oh, okay. They could come okay. in and spend the weekend. Oh, okay. And so, uh, and these sometimes were really quite quite young. Uh, Windsor would keep the little boys. They, hmm. they could come in to Windsor. But Earhart, I don't think they ever changed that part of the policy, which, wow. which is really kind of funny and interesting. Hmm. So, so um, I'm trying to think of what else that they did. Um, of course, we were a part of the streaking. Streaking? <laughs> <laughs> I had daughters at Ball State and IU, and they called and said, Mom, Purdue is the one that is conservative, what do you mean? <laughs> and they came in our front door, came up, went across the front, down the west side, and out the, out the door. Wow. Just and, for Earhart? Oh, no, this was campus. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, this was campus. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. 
What a fun yeah. hobby. They went through a whole time. <laughs> they went through a whole time when this was great fun and, and so forth. And then, you know, it's like everything else. Uh, that, that was when Beverly Stone was dean. Do you, when, when Beverly Stone was dean was when that streaking was going on. You remember it have any recollection? I would think so. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I would think so. Do you have any recollection of those women deans? The only women dean that I really knew was Betty Nelson. Okay. And she had been a faculty fellow. And then when she became dean, she had to give that up because she was in uh -huh. so many places mm -hmm. and invited so many. But her husband remained a faculty fellow for 40 years huh. and just retired a year ago. Is that right? And, but, but Manny attended a lot of our things, yes. And, and we had a lot more interaction with her than we, we had the others. Hmm. Neat. What, what were some of the most rewarding and some of the most challenging aspects of your position? I would think I should take the challenging first. <laughs> and I really don't know that anything was so terribly challenging, except as we had students lose parents and or some family member, and this doesn't go away every day. It's one of those things that's ongoing that you need to check and need to do. And saying the right things and being in the right place. We had a staff resident who lost her father, he, who was a teacher, like the very first month that she was the new staff resident. And Mrs. Harrington and I went to the funeral and her best friend came and said, Mom, you've got to talk to her because she does not want to go back to Purdue. And I thought, you know, oh my goodness, what do you say at this point? And so she took me um, to a room where Sue was and all I could say to her was, so you need to think about what your father would really want for you to do. And I know you want to be there as a support for your mother, but you've made this commitment and your father would want you, you know, to follow through. She came back and later she was a, a speech pathologist and went to the VA hospital in Indianapolis. And she wrote me the nicest note saying, you know, this was such good advice because she not only finished that, but she was able to, because um, I think her father was a veteran. And so she not only finished what she did, but she carried on what she was doing. I think those are things that are challenging as far as the job itself, um, I had tremendous support. Um, the managers, um, I had guidelines, but pretty much was allowed to uh, work within that. And um, since I was the only um, uh, adult in the, in the uh, office, um, pretty much um, I organized and, and uh, um, did whatever official business you needed to do and you needed to keep it professional. I think that was, it wasn't difficult, but you always had to be aware that you represented Earhart Hall and you represented Purdue University. One of the most rewarding was a phone call that I had gotten and it was a mother in Detroit and she had been trying to call her daughter and hadn't got her and so Velma called me and, and she said I'm really concerned and I said well I just saw Nakia in the last hour and she was heading out to study and she said oh you know, 
That's all I needed to know. And then she said, no one that you are there in Earhart Hall, I can sleep in Detroit. And I thought that was one of the nicest compliments that we could be given in Earhart Hall. Not just me, but that we were there. We were that support system. We were the ones who knew the students, knew what was going on, and could reassure parents. So you've, you've mentioned the faculty fellows a few times. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about some of your experiences with the faculty fellows program? Yeah, the, the program was originated with um, Dr. Hubney. And Virginia Ferris, who was our faculty fellow, was the first woman. And when they uh, appointed originally, they were all men. Mm -hmm. And so Virginia came in and she was there until I retired. And she and John both were absolutely um, incredible with support. And John always carried his camera. Uh, the other thing that they did in the fall, they would plan a progressive dinner with the Itasca Club. And three of them would host. And they would go from house to house and have their orders and then the main course and then dessert. And the faculty fellows loved it every much as the uh, uh, officers and uh, uh, the club, you know, did. Mm -hmm. And so um, they came and they mentored. Uh, Dennis Mantella, I remember, was sitting on the floor in the formal lounge and he was tutoring in math. And he had all these students around him, and and they just you know kind of sat, and, and each one of them had something different to contribute, to give, to mentor, and usually they would try to be there once a week for dinner, and then they would sit. Mostly, they liked to sit with their floor because each of them was assigned to a floor. And, and they really liked spending time with the women that were on their floor. But that wasn't necessarily how it had to be. They would visit with whatever students were there. And, and I think, again, the students really benefited seeing those professors outside the classroom being a support system also. And I think this is one of the outstanding things about Purdue University, the tremendous support system that they give students, not only in the residence hall, but throughout the university. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when I was going through things for Earhart, I came across a little bit of news about your retirement party in April of 1998. And from what I could see, it was very well attended. and. It included a police escort and a ride in a fire truck bucket. Is that right? Can you tell us a little bit about it was. that? They the police came out here and picked us up, but before they also brought the uh, Boilermaker Special, and the person driving the Boilermaker Special had been an Earhart resident, <laughs> and so when Joanne was in there, I oh, oh this is so fun, and they ran us around a little bit out here, and then. They headed back in the town, and um, my husband and I were put in the cruiser and, and drove into campus. And we met at Purdue West, got back in the Boilermaker um, uh, Special, and our grandchildren, which was such a thrill for them. And then they took us over to Earhart Hall, and when we got there, there was the fire truck. And how that happened was when they brought the flame for the um, Olympics and it came to Purdue and they were up at Slater Center, they had just gotten that new fire truck and they had it up there. And I told Tom Adams, I said, when I retire, I want to go up in that. <laughs> well, you know, you just say things and then you go on. Well. 
I got there and here sat the fire truck <laughs> and they put my husband and I in it and put us all the way up, Ooh. almost to the top of Earhart Hall. And <laughs> Sheila Clinker was also one of the guests there and she said she came in and there was the fire truck and she said, this can't happen, not in the middle of Lila's party. We cannot have the <laughs> fire department <laughs> having to come in. And she said, but it was part of the party. And so, you know, it was, it was really great fun. And so Angela Wilson, who had been a staff resident, um, came uh, to meet us out there. And, and then she and Purdue Pete uh, escorted us in. And yes, we did. The, the formal lounge was, was totally packed in and up above. And it was one of those celebrations that ended all celebrations because after that nobody got a celebration <laughs> like this. It was way above and beyond. But Becky Moyers was our uh, facilities manager and she said we called in the chips. And so the Glee Club sent a group, the Purdue Ed sent a group. Um, we had uh, well, our faculty fellows didn't skit, our counselors and staff residents didn't skit. Um, Mr. Sutter um, gave a talk. Um, and then I was not able to go to college. I lost my mother when I was seven, and my father raised four daughters. And so he had said that if he couldn't send us all, he wouldn't send any of us. And so, um, Carolyn had heard me say this, and so they also got a cap and gown, and I have an honorary uh, degree for every school at Purdue. Oh my and goodness. And you'll have to see these because these are really fun. And then former uh, uh, counselors, former students, um, staff, uh, each of them did a presentation. So we went through all of that. And then the Purdue police came and they gave me an honorary badge and the uh, Purdue throw and had just knocked themselves out all evening with doing, uh, being a part of this. But all through the time I was there, they not only would walk through if we needed and I needed to call them, they came in, and uh, uh, that again was, I think, a special relationship that made it uh, really, really fun. And so, and then Channel 18 interviewed me, oh and then we finished with a reception. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yes, it was one of the most incredible uh, retirement parties on campus. Um, I think far above what anyone could even <laughs> imagine. And the students that turned out was, you know, and, and I got cards and emails and, and so much from those that couldn't attend. And, and so um, you realize that so many had touched your life but you really had touched lives and you had made a difference. And that was probably um, the greatest satisfaction in the whole town. And didn't uh, Sheila Klinker present you with a state seal too? Oh, yes, yes, I also, yeah. yes, I also have the Sagamore and the Wallace, yes. That's right, okay. Yes, yes. Well, it, it sounds like it was fun. I wish I could have been there. <laughs> it was really an incredible, it was just really incredible um, how they pulled it off and then let me know what was really <laughs> going on because I pretty much knew what went on in their heart. But boy, did they keep a lid on and it was pretty amazing. But I think really the award that meant the most was the special award maker because that was uh, initiated by students and 
it not only was letters written uh, by the students, but I did have um, assistant managers and, and part from administrative staff at residence hall administration. And, but that one again was just so incredible. Bill Fry and I had, had received that in 1986. Well, is there, are there any other memories or recollections that you would like to share with us today? Well, I think um, one of the things that was always such a, a joy, too, was I trained the student office staff, and I worked five nights a week um, after six years. The first six years, I worked six nights a week, and then after that, I worked five. And then the student office staff worked the three shifts on Saturday and three on Sunday. And so we always worked straight through for two weeks, and the weekend in between, check in and check out. And then the student office staff would have the weekend. And they would come in and train with me, and then, you know, if anything else was going on, they'd check in. But they were such a pleasure. Um, they took it seriously, and, you know, we had expectations, and they didn't want to disappoint, I think, with far number two. Uh, they, they wanted the jobs, number one, and it kept them right there in the hall. But they took their responsibilities seriously and did a magnificent job. They really did. And I, this, is again, is why I think students really didn't change. They came in wanting responsibility wanting to do well, wanting to be a success. And, you know, they were willing to do the hard work it took. I bet, it, I wonder if it had something to do with your training style too, though. Oh, I have an expectation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. How did you go about training them? That was different than other people. Oh, I don't know. It was just the way I was. You know, I was always a very organized person, and it wasn't hard. Um, and that started back as a child, as I said. And we ran the household. There were four of us, and we ran the household. And so my father, we were on the farm, and my father didn't have time to be in the house. Mm -hmm. And long before, like he said, just knew it. <laughs> that was what happened in our household. Mm -hmm. You just did it. He, we, we weren't given criticism. It was our job. You do it. You do it the way you're supposed to do it. And that was it. And so I grew up with that a part of me. And it wasn't hard to transfer that to students. Was, this is your job. You do it. You do it well. And nobody is going to be you know, looking over your shoulder. This is your responsibility. And I think that was, that was easy. Yeah. I, have a, I have another question. Yeah. Okay. So when you decided that you wanted a job, of all the places you could have worked, why did you choose Purdue? I really liked working with young people. And having my own daughters in uh, the universities and living in residence halls, that seemed like a, I had done move in and move out in, in other universities. And I, I just thought, you know, we can do this. I, you know, I, I just thought that was really the perfect place for me. That's neat. And I have one last question. It only asked her. <laughs> um, what do you think the secret is to having such a magnetic personality? Because truly, you're a a person that's a, set apart from the rest. Well, I think when I shared at our 50th anniversary, I said, you have to love yourself first because you can't give anything you don't have. And I think you have to care enough 
about who's living in your skin that you can be satisfied with who you are. And if you're satisfied with who you are, you can transfer that and be satisfied with allowing somebody else to be who they are. And I think that kind of caring, that kind of who you are, that's who you share, um, got that kind of response back. And so I, I, you know, I, I don't think there was any magic secret to, to <laughs> no, this. no magic formula. But it was interesting. I had um, a student um, whose father was a, a lawyer. He had played football for Notre Dame, and she was one of my, that worked in the office. And she brought her father down, and he was this really big, good-looking man, and she <laughs> said to him, Dad, I want you to meet Mom. <laughs> and I put my hand across the counter, and he took my hand and had the biggest smile on his face. And it was hilarious, really, to watch. And she was so pleased. She was so pleased that her father had finally had this chance to meet me, because she and her mother had come for day on campus and stuff. But he responded in such a positive way that it didn't, I mean, it really enhanced the whole thing for not only her, but for me as well. And it was, it was great fun, yeah. Neat. Well, thank you for letting us talk with you. It's been delightful to listen to all of your stories. And I was excited to, to meet with you after the event. I enjoyed your speech at the April 12th event. Thank you so very, very much. I just think it is so important to preserve um, what has gone on because um, we have a very special residence hall system. And Purdue is a very special place for students to come to the university. And I, you know, I would sell it in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect.